Hi, everybody. Welcome to week five of ABCD Reaper NIM. Um, it's been a busy week for everybody. And so before we get started, I wanted to briefly take a minute to say that we are rapidly approaching the end of session one. And I want to offer an apology, give some thanks and express our solidarity before we get really get started here. Uh, first of all, apologies for this week. We had some delays uh, getting the video and the quizzes out to you. Uh, Tropical storm Ada <laughs> left many parts of South Florida flooded and our schools and businesses were closed for several days. And that caused some hiccups uh, primarily on my end. And so apologies for that, but a big thank you to the rest of the ABCD Reaper NIM team. My very wonderful colleagues here who were able to take the lead while I was offline dealing with family and childcare issues. Um, which leads me to also say that we want to give a really big thank you to all of the students in this course. Um, I haven't really spoken to a single human being since March who says that they are living their absolute best lives in the year 2020. And um, most everybody I know is really struggling to meet the challenges of this frankly terrible year. And so it's really easy to put, kind of get caught up in our own mess and forget that there are real life folks out there who are encountering similar personal challenges. And so we want to thank everybody for continuing to stick with us. We thank you for your resilience and your tenacity um, despite these challenges. And, you know, as I mentioned, coming to the end of session one, um, this is going to coincide with a lengthy holiday season here in the US. Um, you know, when we were designing the course schedule, we knew that it would be best to take a break during this time. This gives us an opportunity to catch up. Um, this gives you an opportunity to catch up on the lectures, on the videos, on the assignments. We're going to start talking about proposals um, more frequently as we move into session two. So taking the time now, um, it's okay that many of you are behind in some of our scheduling and the session one, the break between session one and session two will really give us an opportunity um, to use the time to maybe address some of the projects as you've been working on and swing back to some of the course assignments. And it will let us catch up as well. You know, we have a lot of things that we have planned for session two and session and project week, and we want to make sure that we have a chance to make that helpful. But then I also want to say, um, and acknowledge that as we're continuing to live our lives in the midst of a global pandemic, which is entering a very dangerous surge um, and period of many infections and sadly very many deaths. Um, during this break, we want to know that everyone is going to be making decisions about the upcoming holidays. And in the interest of everyone's health and safety, I want to briefly acknowledge the sadness that we are all feeling at canceling uh, what are our traditional holiday plans but to urge everyone in this course to please follow public health guidelines and to take every precaution to protect yourself and your family members. I know we're all tired of COVID. COVID, 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 COVID. But COVID is not tired of us. And so as we move through these next three weeks, as we finish up session one, as we move through the break, um, we all want you to be safe and to be well so that when we resume session two in January, um, we can do so um, united as a group. So with that said, I will finish up my little uh, intro here and welcome our, our week five attendees. We have Susan Taper, who is um, here from University of California, San Diego, and also Marianne Martone, coincidentally, same institution. They gave lectures this week on ABCD neurocognitive assessments and FAIR data and semantic markup. Susan, could you take a moment to briefly introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Susan. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I've uh, been doing adolescent substance use research for a long time with a focus on neurocognitive consequences. And I'm an ABCD site PI and an associate um, director of ABCD. Thank you very much. And Marianne, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Marianne Martone. I'm actually a professor emerita at the Department of Neurosciences at UCSD. I actually started my career in microscopic imaging, and you can see one of the large mosaics that we took uh, about 20 years ago, uh, I think at this point. <laughs> uh, but now I'm uh, almost exclusively in neuroinformatics. Uh, I was one of the authors on the FAIR Data Principles. And I'm also currently the chair of the governing board of the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, which is an organization that's dedicated to open and fair neuroscience. 
Thank you both. Welcome to you both. And we look forward to having our students ask you some fun questions. Um, before we get started, we are thinking about Project Week that is very much on our minds. And we still want to get a sense of who has gained access to ABCD data, who's in the process of gaining access to ABCD data, and who's not going to be able to gain access. Um, so for enrolled students, if you go to Canvas, there is a quiz called ABCD Data Access Duck Status Survey. Please just quickly fill that out to let us know where you are in the process so that we have an idea of how many students are, are likely going to be able to participate in Project Week. As of today, only 11 students have filled this out. Um, again, I know everybody's behind, I get it, but please kind of keep an eye on um, filling out that survey for us so that we can do some planning over the break that's coming up. Um, if your duck has been approved, also remember to complete that ABCD data access confirmation survey. That's going to be our official list of who gets the official invitation to, to Project Week or not. We have a good number of folks who have completed that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, we need those to keep on rolling in. Okay, so with that, I will hand it over for, for to Dave for his announcements. Hi, uh, welcome again to uh, week five and thank you to our uh, instructors for being here. Uh, the only one announcement I have before turning things over to other announcements from Jessica is to remind you, the enrolled students, that the uh, Jupyter Hub is available. I know maybe half of you have uh, accessed it. That's great. Uh, if anyone's having any troubles with that, let us know through the data exercises Slack channel and we're here to help on that. We haven't used it intensively yet, but we're ramping up and so you can want to make sure you're yeah, accessing it. So as we ramp up our use of it, uh, we, we know that we've covered those basic uh, access issues. So I think that's my, and there's a little you know, quick quiz in, in the canvas for you to just help us know that you've got that you know, down uh, and not worry about you uh, in that way. Uh, so I believe I'll introduce Lisa as our uh, uh, lead TA for today. Say hi and a word or two about yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, so I led the, the first Q&A session, so I think I've introduced okay. myself to most people. Um, but anyway, yes, my name is Lisa. I'm a PhD candidate through the joint uh, neuroscience program between the NIMH and UCL in London. Great, thanks. And I guess I will turn things over to Jessica for the last of our introduction. Oh, thanks. Three. I need to unmute myself. I don't have too many um, announcements to make. Just want to um, kind of parallel what Angie was saying. Uh, again, we're sorry that uh, we had some late rollout of material this week due to extenuating circumstances. The schedule should be back on for next week, but um, uh, we, we've received uh, a few messages from students uh, just apologizing for getting behind on material. That's okay. I mean, we, we've designed this course so that it can be synchronous or asynchronous. And um, I just wanted to note that uh, next week will be our last um, session one Q and instructor Q&A session. And then you'll have, like Angie was saying, uh, a bit of time over the holidays to catch up on uh, the quizzes that you may not have finished um, and, and uh, think about your projects and maybe start submitting proposals, which we'll make an announcement about soon. Um, those are my only announcements for this week. Uh, again, um, make sure uh, if you can this week, there's just one question for the ABCD data access doc survey that Angie was talking about. It is a single question for enrolled students on the campus. If you can just fill that out, that would be awesome. Um, and uh, I guess with that, I will turn it over to some questions for Susan and Marianne. Yeah, um, I was thinking we could start with some ABCD questions first, and there's a lot of really good ones. Um, so the first one is, I noticed that the card sort task will only be used at baseline. Is there another task that could be used as a proxy for cognitive flexibility or reinforcement learning that will be done each year? Given the preclinical literature for substance use using tasks like this, it seems like a disadvantage to not have them each year. So I was wondering if maybe certain indices from other tasks that are included annually could stand in for, for some of these constructs. Hey, great. Great question. Uh, such an excellent question. And we have an ABCD, a work group of neurocognitive experts that meet several times a month to talk about these very issues and to prioritize for each wave of data what 
tasks we should uh, collect. We have minimal amount of time with the kids, so we can't give everything that we would like. At baseline, as you notice, we give the NIH toolbox dimensional card sort task, and we will give it again in the protocol. We were going to give it again at the four-year follow-up, which starts next week, but because we're in a pandemic and this is one of the tasks that can't be administered remotely we thought let's wait until we'll be able to give this to everybody in abcd so probably at the six-year follow-up hopefully the pandemic's over by then we will give that task uh, again awesome thank you so much um if i may i'll give you one more question for abcd and then i'll switch over to marianne with a reprint of question um, so this one is, have there been choices as to what data is distributed for the neurocognitive assessments are, or are all data that have been recorded during the assessment distributed, for example, item level versus summary statistics? Do we have access to the trial level data stimuli, stimuli and how they map onto one another? Great question. So in general, in the, the like main part of the data release, we include the, the overall scores on the overall task for each participant. And that includes, you know, there's several scores, of course, for each task. There are trial level or kind of item level data that are available through uh, the fast track uh, data. And it's in a, you know, the different form. It's a little bit harder to use. It's not as deeply curated as the summary scores are, but, but those are available. Again, depending on when the collection of the data occurred, that's kind of what drives in which release you'll see those data. Cool. Thank you. you. If you want to probe the tasks themselves a little bit more, you can go to um, some of our tasks are given through a platform called Millisecond, and you can go to Millisecond and look up the ABCD tasks and download it to their Inquisit platform and like play around with the tasks themselves so you get a really good feel for the concepts being measured. Are there charges associated with that? That is free. That is free. If you're going to collect data and stuff, then you would have to pay millisecond. But if you just want to download and test out the tasks, totally free. Cool. That's good. There was also a question actually um, that relates to this and whether or not students can go ahead and like just uh, um, use the stimuli that are used. So that is good to know that some of the millisecond ones can be reused. But if you're trying to actually collect data, then you may have to pay a fee. That is correct. Okay. You would have to like talk to millisecond and probably pay the money and stuff. Got it. Cool. Um, so there's um, a more high level fair principles question that I will ask Marianne. Mm -hmm. So the question is, all of the fair principles make sense. However, for a lab where these practices are not in place, total adoption seems overwhelming, especially for a graduate student who has coursework and research duties. What would you suggest are the first simple and practical steps to make my research more fair when there's already so much going on? <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent question. And one of the reasons that I like to break the FAIR uh, principles into a FAIR partnership is to let everyone know that the full burden of FAIR doesn't necessarily rest entirely on the shoulders of the investigator. However, there are certain things that if the investigator doesn't do, then you can never make the data FAIR afterwards, right? So if your data are not documented, if they're in proprietary formats, I mean, there's a whole uh, set of things that would make it really difficult to make data interoperable later on. I would say that the best thing to do is, again, to implement good data management practices in the laboratory. Obviously, as the tooling and Repronym and others uh, start to increase, a lot of that can be offloaded to some more automated tools. But for right now, it's largely a manual practice. And as I like to say to uh, students, I don't remember whether I said it in my lecture, uh, it's actually good that I have a microscopy image behind me. Because when I started back in the very early days of uh, um, the internet, right, everything was done manually. You had to go develop your film. You had to develop electron micrographs. And you used to end up with 60 and 70 gigantic negatives. And in the laboratory I was in, you used to have to sit there at the end of every day and meticulously document each one of those negatives so that you knew what it came from, what the specimen was, what, micro what microscope. There was a standard set of metadata that we attached to each negative. As with a lot of labs, and I've talked to a lot of older researchers about this, that as digital started to come in, these very meticulous practices started to go out the window because a lot of stuff was done digitally, it was on all kinds of media, right? It was in, in all of these places where people no longer had control over what they did. 
and you started to notice a decrease in the quality of the annotations that were associated with these. Even when we were still in the early days of negatives, you would see large stacks of negatives that would be wrapped in a rubber band and have a piece of cardboard that says, these are from some experiment. But of course, once you took the rubber band off, all that data became useless because nobody knew what it was. So as I've liked to say over the years, I have often regretted not annotating my data sufficiently. I have never regretted annotating my data sufficiently. And so I would say that those are the, the, the biggest thing that you need to do is to make sure you adhere to good metadata practices. Those include standard file names, right? Like bids says, uh, organize them in a standard way. Make sure that you know what that standard is. Make sure that that standard is document and annotate, annotate, annotate because if you do that, then you can move it on to the next step, even as that may be a moving target. The use of fair vocabularies, I think, is an interesting one. I saw a question on this. And again, the amount of shorthand that people use when they annotate their data is extraordinary. Uh, I would often go into students' files where they were segmenting these microscopy images, and the name of the structure would be red because that's the color label that they used, right? So always think about, again, is this even going to be informative to me in three months or three years? So if you think about future you and what you would like to see in your data, it becomes a lot easier than thinking about what a third party would do, because oftentimes we, we come on things, I think all of the seasoned people here can say that, right? You go back to your data and you're like, no, I don't know what it means. I didn't, I didn't capture this. So getting into the habit of treating data respectfully, where when you do this, you sit down and you put the time and energy into doing that, establish a, a standard practice, then that makes it a lot easier than if somebody says, oh, you know what, you need to uh, adhere to this principle or you need to turn it into this format. It may, be, it may take time, but you can at least do it. The thing that's the most frustrating when we try to share data is when the information is unrecoverable. So that would be uh, my advice. Not worry about some of the substance of FAIR, like do I need qualified references and what have you. Those are more specialized things, but really, really focus on data management practices. Um, and Marianne, are there yet any tools that are particularly useful? I, I know that depends on field and things like that, but and I know some things are in plans and various stages at Reprenim, but. Uh, in general, there are other tools that are important to you in that area? Uh, I would say mostly what I've seen is that there's a lot of courses in uh, the libraries and coming out of um, you know, the data librarians that just talk about generic lab practices. And some people are using electronic lab notebooks. Some people don't. A lot of those really, again, depend on the discipline that you populate things appropriately. And um, the more fair we get where you can, for example, type in a catalog number of a reagent and have that metadata pulled and put into your, you know, into your record, the better off we are. But I'd say that, again, that the, the diversity of data that we have, you just have to find a solution that works for you and that being trained on general principles then allows you to select the tools appropriately as they come on board. We're not really, in my view, going to be able to push for fully fair data until information management in the laboratory is a lot more automated. Right. I, I think that that is 100% true. I like to say that if a human is going to fill out a form, you can ask for maybe 10 things. If you try to ask for more than that, you're not going to get it. Um, but as the tools automatically capture this and structure it, then we can start to ask for more and more. Thanks. Yeah, no, those are really good points. Um, and I just also wanted to mention that, um, thank you, Susan. I see that you've been answering a lot of the questions just like directly in the Q&A chat box. So I was just going to say to everybody else, um, definitely go and take a look at, at the document that we have for the Q&A session, because all of the answers are being copy and pasted over there or just being transcribed in that document as well. Um, so at the moment, we only have three questions actually left. Um, so I'll go back to an, an ABCD question. So, oh, that one was answered. There's another one. So for functional imaging tasks, such as the MID, is there informative task performance data or are the tasks only used for the imaging response? Great question. So there's three fMRI tasks that we use in ABCD, the monetary incentive delay task, 
a stop signal task and an emotional um, and back task. And we do have performance data for all three of those tasks. Again, I believe it is through the fast track part where you can get the trial level data. Um, it's a, you know, again, it's, it's um, for experienced users, <laughs> uh, I, I would say, but you can use those data if you wanted to reprocess the data yourself, looking at certain features of task performance to excise certain trials and things if, if you wanted to go down that road and have a giant computer at your disposal. Um, those uh, data are also used at the summary level in a way that, uh, that are essentially cognitive tasks where you can look at the uh, accuracy level of their performance on those tasks for the different conditions. Um, and Jessica Bartley also just made a really good point just in a chat to me just that um, some students might not some students might not be able to see the responses at the moment. So um, if it would be okay, we can just maybe go over some of the questions that have already been answered live as well. Yeah. Um, so one of them was um, what training are research assistants given to administer these tasks is that is there a script that they read from. Yes, this is a great question. We do quite a bit with the training in ABCD. So uh, one thing is we have an annual in-person meeting that we call the train the trainer meeting and we invite the project coordinator and usually another uh, lead RA from each site to come in person. We work on stuff on the fly and then go back to your site and train the rest of your staff on stuff. We did it by Zoom this year, uh, of course. We have weekly RA meetings in AVCD that are led by our wonderful site monitors where we kind of go into depth on different topics of the protocol and, and talk about managing various uh, funky things that can come up or unusual situations that can come up. So everybody's kind of prepared to manage those things in the same manner. We have two site monitors who uh, typically travel to each of the 21 sites, spend about four or five days there to observe RAs administering the protocol to real ABCD participants. And this is to kind of make sure that all sites are doing things in as similar a manner as possible. You know, study of this large, it's easy to imagine that different sites could develop their own idiosyncratic ways of doing things. We really want to guard against that. And another thing is to make sure that the instructions aren't just kind of something that you make up on the fly, but they are presented on a screen. So everything that is scripted, we make a script and in, really encourage the RAs to read it exactly as it says. So we don't end up with different instruction sets being conveyed to the participants differentially. Seems so like let me, let me follow up on that and say from the site's perspective, um, that level of coordination has been, to me, one of the most remarkable aspects of this project. We, we are absolutely given the training and the materials and the time to make sure that we are implementing the protocol in the same way that the other sites are, are, are doing it. And to me, I mean, that's just excellent science, right? So I really appreciate the coordinating, coordinating center's ability to make sure that we know how to do this appropriately. And I will also say that those um, site monitors, those annual site visits, those are a scary thing, right? This is someone coming in who is absolutely doing a very formal, very quantitative evaluation of all of the things that make up ABCD at our institution. And there's nervousness on our part. We want to do well. We want to get a good grade. Um, the 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 site monitors that come to visit us, they are wonderful human beings and they're so very well qualified to do what they do, but it is very much an opportunity for us to shine, but we, we do so in a way that um, it makes us nervous. And so that's another sort of unique aspect to this study that I, I hadn't anticipated, but has been done very effectively and really helps with the overall goals of the study, which is to deliver a protocol to so many different sites, but to do so in a way that the data you get back um, can be harmonized and pulled together. So just wanted to give the site's perspective there. Yeah, and I kind of want to piggyback a little bit on that question with a question that I had when I was watching your lecture, Susan, um, because uh, I know you, as we're talking about right now, you had mentioned the importance of making sure that it's uniform across all these sites because it's a longitudinal study and we need to make sure that these are um, these measures are being collected in the same way across all the sites and across time. But I am wondering how making things virtual and because of the pandemic has 
potentially impacted that? And um, it, how can how can researchers account for that in the analyses that they do? Yeah, that is such a great question, Jessica. So, you know, in March, we realized that this was going to be an issue. And so we quickly went to make as much doable remotely as possible. And almost all sites are now seeing some kids on site again safely, because obviously the MRI cannot be done remotely. Um, and so we do a few things during the in-person appointment, but a lot of the protocol elements continue to be done uh, remotely during, you know, with Zoom and, and phone with the kids. So we added codes to a lot of the measures uh, to indicate the method in which it was delivered. Some of the tasks uh, from the olden times were done in person, and there's a code kind of for each measure to indicate that. None of those data are in ENDA 3.0 because ENDA 3.0 just contains data that were collected before um, pretty much January 2020 or earlier. But the next data release, you'll see all these different codes that indicate if something was done, uh, you know, by, you know, virtually or by, and even virtually. There's a few codes to specify if there was, you know, camera happening because a couple of the kids in the study, they do not have camera uh, computers at home. So there's going to be a lot of data on that. And I think it will be really important to control for. We've taken a look already in a between subject manner at the performance on the cognitive tasks of the kids who have received their testing during the pandemic compared to those who received it in a couple of months before. And there are a few differences. A lot of the tasks doesn't make that big of a difference, but for tasks where you're looking at reaction time, there's more variability if you're doing it in this uh, kind of method compared to on site. The other is for tasks that require sustained attention for a longer period of time, like the uh, verbal learning and memory task, where you have to really, you know, focus. And if your little brother is in the back and he's popping in and, you know, it's it, so we see more range in performance on the on the verbal learning and memory task for the remote assessment. So really, I think, important to control for in analyses moving forward. Cool. Um, I guess there's one more reprint of question at the moment. Um, would you recommend that we keep all metadata structured? Are there any advantages to unstructured metadata? That's an excellent question. And I was hoping that we were going to get to it. <laughs> uh, because um, let me just start off with uh, uh, two little stories about this, because that's how I like to, uh, uh, that's how I like to teach. The first story, actually, you won't be able to see this, but there's a huge scar running all the way up the side of my finger. And that's because I made the mistake of using a uh, mechanical nail clipper on my cat and she objected and she actually raked me from, from stem to stern right here. And I went to the emergency room at one point because I couldn't close my hand and it was getting red and very swollen and I, I know cat scratches are uh, actually fairly serious. And um, the doctor, it was late on a Saturday night and uh, they, they were struggling with the codes that they needed to have for uh, you know billing purposes and they couldn't find cat scratch. The best they could come up with was animal bite and she's just like, oh, screw it, I'm gonna put animal bite down. So I'm in the database with a structured code of an animal bite when in fact, this is a cat scratch. So sometimes of course the value sets and things are not available and you can structure it. And if it doesn't say precisely what it is that you are trying to convey, are you better off structuring with something that's close like an animal bite or are you better off in fact not using uh, structured metadata but uh, in fact perhaps writing free text and I would argue that you are better off conveying what it is that you are trying to convey rather than trying to fit into a rigid structure. Um, we had a good example of that in another um, uh, project that I was doing. We used to have an online uh, wiki called Neurolex where people could build vocabularies and they could add their vocabularies to it. And we had this interesting little structured uh, metadata, but it was a semantic wiki. So in fact, you could, you could put relationships, you could fill in uh, values with other concepts that were already there. It was very much like building an ontology. So we gave uh, a group of neuronal experts uh, a, a task. There were 30 of the leading experts on their cell types. And we asked them to structure the metadata regarding where the cell bodies were, where the dendrites were, and where the axons were. Because um, you know, neurons are very big and they project all over the place. 
And it was really interesting when we analyzed this. We had 300 neurons there and everybody was able to complete the cell body task because that was, I'm going to locate the cell body inside of a um, brain region. So this was in the hippocampus and this was in dentate gyrus, this was CA1, right? Even layers, they could do that correctly. And the concepts that they needed in order to do that were 100% clear. But then when they started to answer where the dendrites were and where the axons were, the vocabulary was, in, uh, was, was not adequate. The model wasn't adequate because in order to say where the axons were, you'd have to take a huge collateral and come up with 50 brain regions. You'd have to say where this segment, this segment, where's the ends. And you could see that what people did in that case, because the semantic wiki was nice, if there was a concept that existed, it auto-completed. If there wasn't, then you could just revert to free text. And you could see that every single researcher reverted to free text in order to, again, be able to convey completely what it is they were trying to say and where the model was clearly not adequate for conveying what they wanted to say. And even if it were, it would have been so complicated that nobody would have been able to fill it in. Because as I said, you get about 10 things rather than uh, uh, 100, which is what you would need. So clearly that was a case where if you really wanted a, a semantic structured metadata model on where these axons were going. You needed better toolings that would allow people either to draw or you know, place these, these neuron models in context and pick up the semantics from behind it. So in general, as we talked about in the lecture, structured metadata is very powerful. It lets you do things with it. It lets you sort, it lets you, you know, it, 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 it allows all kinds of additional functions to be built on top of it. But if the structure isn't adequate for what it is that you're trying to convey, then you really don't want to try to impose it in there because otherwise you'll end up with cat bites, right? And you'll end up with all kinds of things that are inaccurate. And so I would say, again, it is better in fact to uh, resort to free text and have it available. NLP is getting more powerful. Other sorts of things are happening that would make that in fact useful down the line. It was interesting on a panel that I was on, um, uh, on the forecasting costs for long-term preservation, I actually spoke with somebody uh, from the National Archives. And obviously the National Archives are in the business of preservation and long-term preservation. And we were talking about metadata and he said he had seen a lot of projects actually crash and burn because they insisted that their metadata be structured and structured to such a degree that it stopped people from actually capturing the details that they needed to capture in order to make it useful. So as with everything, there's always a happy medium here. And I would say, again, if it's well documented and you've captured that information, then it is potentially recoverable and usable in all of its nuances. What I usually recommend to my computer programmers is every single field that we have needs to have a comment field, right? So that somebody can convey the knowledge that they want to put in there, even if the field itself can't capture it. Because I'd say in the long run, we are better off having those nuances than having things that are either poorly structured or inaccurate. So as usual in life, balance. <laughs> So Marianne, I feel this deeply in my bones. Um, and I just want to give a, a personal perspective to this. I spent 10 years working on the Brain Map database project, which is seeking to develop a taxonomy, ontology, a schema for representing cognitive neuroimaging experiments. And, and we thought, you know, we've we've spent 20 to 30 years trying to figure out what does that actually look at, look like? What are the fields? What are the terms? What are the relationships? And um, for a long time, I focused on using those data to try to enhance the, the brain structure to function mappings that, that we know of in, in, in cognitive neuroscience. And things can be very hard to um, uh, represent when you're using a structured taxonomy, whereas, so for example, the word uh, load in working memory there's no way of representing that in the brain map taxonomy. So by analogy, the Neurosynth database draws on terms directly from authors by harvesting, um, text mining the abstracts that are, are, are archived with each paper. And, you know, obviously if it is a paper about working memory load, that word, that term is going to be all over the paper and it's going to map to that particular uh, paper in the database. 
And so there's, there's a lot to be said for that nuance and that specificity of coming up with a single term that, that you know captures your paper that perhaps is not captured in those structured taxonomies and ontologies. So um, I do think that there is a need for both because without structure, then it's chaos. Um, but for our, our neuroinformatics experts to continue to try to find a ways for integration of the structured taxonomies and the, and the unstructured author derived terms, I think that potentially represents where we'll find some real progress on this. And I absolutely agree. I said, you know, it, it, throughout our lives in, in my laboratory, we've always built hybrid systems. And my rule of thumb is let something do what it does well. So there's a lot of information that you can structure and you should structure for all the reasons that we've said. And that generally means that the concept is well understood, that it can be reliably applied by multiple groups. That is, they wouldn't all interpret uh, my address differently. They'd all say, no, I'm assuming that that's your institution address or your home address, right? So, so use what you can, but then if it no longer holds, then you should again, create hybrid systems that can take advantage of more unstructured data, semi-structured data. And what I like to do, especially even in, in, in papers and others, is do you want to use, for example, uh, identifiers to disambiguate concepts that are, that are easy to confuse, right? Nucleus of a cell, nucleus of a brain, nucleus of whatever, right? There are places where they really help in order to allow the computers and others to do their job so that you don't have to spend um, all of your time trying to do things that are conceptually trivial <laughs> and we can put our compute power towards things that are much harder. That's one of the reasons I was a big fan of the ORCID because I said, look, you know, the number, the amount of text mining challenges and others to do author disambiguation is tremendous and that's great, but let's just not, let's take that off the table and use our ORCIDs, right? <laughs> <laughs> then we kind of, we don't eliminate the problem, but we reduce the complexity of it. And usually the complexity is I have four orchids and I can't remember and I haven't reconciled them, but that's far different than what we've had before. So I am always a fan of more metadata and however you can get that metadata to me, I will take it because as I said, the, you know, the algorithms and other things are getting better. So if, if you were to ask me, do you want to spend more time trying to develop this data model at this point, because every project you have so many people, so much time, right? <laughs> so many tools available to you, we're all resource limited. Then you really want to do the things that are going to capture the most metadata in the most useful form possible. And if that's free text, then that's free text. Uh, I know we've discussed this at fairly great length, but the other thing is, uh, since all of our techniques are moving and the types of experiments we do are moving, we can't sit around and wait for the perfect, you know, ontology, the perfect set of lexical descriptions. If we wait around for that, that'll never happen. And then we'll have, the technologies will have moved on. So again, we're bound to be in this sort of dual mode because of the movement of technology. And then the, the taxonomies and, and ontologies, you know, catch up based on, on how we end up, you know, evolving our, our technology. Um, I'd just like to mention that um, there's a related question that had already been answered by Marianne in the, in the Q&A portal. Um, but for those of you who can't actually see this at the moment, somebody asked, how do I know what concepts have identifiers and where do I find them? You mentioned Uberon, but where can I go for cognitive measures? Is there a database of semantic concepts? Um, and Marianne, you pointed people to BioPortal and I believe it was uh, SciCrunch and Interlex, was it? Interlex, yes. that's Interlex. the uh, successor to Neuralex. Yeah. Um, there is an ABCD question, um, which Susan has already also answered, but I think it might be helpful if this were reiterated out loud as well. Um, so the question was, can Dr. Tappert further explain her point made in the lecture, overlapping assessments of youngest at around um, age nine at baseline and age 11 at two year follow up with oldest subjects at age 10.9 at baseline, allowing for once versus, once versus twice tested estimation of practice effects in the context of development. Uh, yes, great question. So, you know, uh, with repeated cognitive assessment, we'll have to take a look at the effects of practice. Uh, what, what, you know, how much better do you do the second time in a task because you have done it before. So there's a couple of different ways we can kind of get at this. The complicating factor is that also getting older helps you do better on tasks. <laughs> so we have time passing and development and then you know you're getting the same task again and again. And in a lot of studies, you know, when we look at say mental health conditions or the effects of substance use, sometimes the effect of that issue is that you don't benefit from repeated testing 
as much as people without that condition. So a couple of things that will help us to be able to disentangle some of these things a little bit. One is that when we're doing the follow up, some kids, we have to see them a little early and some we see a little late compared to their due date just by by chance and practicalities. So we have at the two year follow up a couple of kids who had the two year follow up at they weren't quite 11 years old. And so that'll help us actually a little bit disentangle some of the effects of development from practice. We also anticipate that over time, of course, there will be some kids who say by the six year follow up, they they won't have had the neurocognitive tasks every time. A few of them will maybe have had it twice because they moved to Uruguay or something. So some of those variabilities actually are a good thing in this study because they'll help us to be able to disentangle some of the effects of practice. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, we don't have any remaining questions that haven't been answered in the chat. I don't know if um, Angie or Dave want anything else to be discussed in particular. I actually wanted to give um, Susan an opportunity to comment on the COVID substudy. Susan, we have had a number of questions in earlier Q and A's about COVID and its impact. And um, someone brought up that we did have an Irma substudy and was wondering if there was going to be a COVID substudy. So, given that you're here, I was thinking maybe you could kind of describe what the COVID substudy looks like and 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 how that process has unfolded. Yes, thanks, Angie. Well, thanks a lot to the to the genius and quick thinking of ABC investigators at FIU who developed the Hurricane Irma sub study. We kind of piggybacked onto uh, what Anthony Dick and some of the other folks had done there to quickly try to respond to this um, opportunity and need for understanding how the pandemic is affecting kids you know, mental health and cognitive development and family relationships and everything. So we were really lucky to get funding from the National Science Foundation, uh, some supplements from NIDA and some other NIH institutes to uh, kind of do something a little bit different in ABCD, which is to send to all kids in the study and their participating parent uh, a monthly survey it's about a 10 minute survey that they complete on their own to ask things about their school situation. You know, is it remote or in person? Uh, how are relations going in your family? Are you seeing friends or not? We're also asking about things like public, public health adherence. Um, you know, have in the past what month have you worn a mask or not? Things like that. Are you getting where are your sources for news and information about coronavirus? So there's a lot of different things that we'll be able to look at just with those survey data, but even more importantly, linking those survey data to the wealth of data we already have about these kids and their brains and their cognition and their genetics. Uh, so we think down the line, this will be really helpful to understanding the impact of a situation like this on development. So one of the things that is important to consider is that when things like hurricanes or global pandemics come along, a lot of times researchers start asking questions about people's experiences to try to understand that. And a big gap in our knowledge is having pre-event baseline data available. So it's, it's very hard to understand how a disaster or an event has had an impact on your life if you don't have measurable data on what your life was like before that. So with respect to the Irma substudy, as well as now to the COVID substudy, um, that's the real beauty and the power of what ABC ABCD has to offer. So since 2016, we've been collecting information and data about these kids. And so we have that baseline data. Um, so for me, that's a, a very exciting point to highlight. Um, I'm going to also swing back to a point that you made because I want I want folks to understand, um, you know, ABCD, they get a lot of money from NIH to fund this study to make sure that the staff are there. Um, why was additional funding needed to uh, to make sure that we could do the COVID sub study? Oh, great question. Yeah. Uh, 
it, you know, it, it seems like a big budget for ABCD. It's a kind of everything gets sort of allocated, right? So we were really fortunate to receive seven years of refunding um, in March. And so, you know, money goes to the sites for collecting the data and to certain people to do certain things that were existing. There actually isn't a lot of padding. So we would have had to eliminate like something pretty core to the study already to be able to do the the needed informatics um, paying the participants, of course, which is the biggest part of the budget for the COVID sub study actually is that we're paying the kids and the parents each, you know, a $5 gift card whenever they fill out the questionnaire. And that adds up if you multiply it by, you know, 11,000. So great question. I just want to add for you guys who are interested in the ABCD data that we are able to make a release of these COVID questionnaires. The first three of them should be coming out in December and they're, you know, survey forms with data dictionaries and you can look at those in relation to the data from ENDA 3.0. Perfect. That actually answers a question that had just been posted about when we might have an estimate for um, this data being released. Um, there's another question pertaining to CBCL. Um, so it's in addition to the eight subscales from the CBCL plus um, this internal external total scores, there are three subscales from the CBCL scale 2007. Um, are these from a different CBCL report? There is just one CBCL, uh, you know, version that we're using in ABCD. There are a number of different kinds of summary scores. So there's the, the kind of main factor scores, which there's eight. And some of those are externalizing conditions and some are externalizing, then there's a total score. But then there's um, some additional summary scores that I think we included in the scoring that was available in 3.0 as well, in addition to the item level uh, data. Uh, so I hope I answered your question. I don't know offhand the names of the variables. <laughs> uh, uh, it wasn't my, my question. I was just, it was another yes, student's question. Uh, Hodger, and um, you can email me and I can find out your question. I'll put my email address here if I haven't answered your question. Thank you so okay, much. Sure. All right. Have we answered all of the questions? Looks like it. All right. We'll give one last call for uh, additional questions to be popped into the Q&A right now. And if not, then um, we will go ahead and end this Q&A. Um, a huge, huge thanks to Susan and Marianne for being with us today and for providing us with really helpful lectures. Um, we were excited to hear from you both, and hopefully our students will um, be able to take this knowledge and apply it to the projects that they're going to be working on during Project Week, which will be in March. So, it was a lot of fun, yes. and uh, certainly I think that my email is there or Slack if, if you have any questions. I'm always happy to answer it. Yeah. Excellent. And a lot of these questions were answered um, uh, typed, not necessarily live. So we will post these to the Q&A doc. So um, if the observer students who are watching along couldn't see them live, then they'll be able to read them uh, after this is aired. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We hope you have a good weekend. We will see you next week, uh, same time, same place for the last Q&A of session one. Thanks, everybody.